and with us tonight uh, for our Wednesday night uh, Bible study and, and prayer time. Um, just uh, before we get into uh, the Bible study about Paul, thank for those that are uh, watching us tonight and uh, on Facebook or whatever. We appreciate uh, you tuning in tonight. Pray that God will, will bless you by even though you're not able to be here, but you're still able to be a part of here. And so we thank you for that. Now, <clears throat> I got a song that I'm going to play for you. And uh, if there was ever a song, I want you to listen so close to these words. If there was ever a song that told you how I feel tonight, this is it. I want you to listen to it, because this song talks about that the world that we live in today, he, the, the, she calls it, as she sings, she calls it Satan's Edom. Eden, not God's Eden, but we live in Satan's Eden now. And, uh, and another thing she says in the second part of the song is this. That this world has lost its attraction for me anymore. Sometimes when old Satan comes at you and he kind of knocks you down in the valley a little bit, sometimes you start looking a little higher. And that's what she says in this song. I want you to listen closely to the words of this song. McCain's Brother Dwight. <laughs> I've had my days of laughter in the sunshine. Felt peace and contentment in my soul. Could it be that? 
just joy on every hand. Someday we're gonna leave it all behind us. Someday we'll walk this way no more. Somewhere it's called. I'm thankful that someday I'm going home. The Lord promised us that he'd come back and get us. And I'm ready to go. I'm glad that I'm his and he's mine. And I'm ready. And I can almost hear the trumpet for the Lord to come again. Amen. Wars right. of strike. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I've li you know how many times that... Uh, I've listened to that song today. It's just been kind of a day. You have those every once in a while. And, uh, and I thought, you know, he said, you know, in that song it says, this world is, is lost, it's attraction. Maybe. But I got to thinking coming to church tonight, what is there that makes you want to keep keeping on? And God put three things in my mind. My family, you, and my calling. Those three things are what keeps me hanging on. That's it. Nothing else. Ain't nothing else down here. The rest of it's done, I mean, you were talking about it, it's done lost its appeal to me. You, my family, and my calling. That's what I got now. But you know what? I'm glad to have that. And that's the joy of my life right now. All right. I just share that with you. I just, I don't know, just been one of them crying days, you know. You just get like that every once in a while. Everybody does. That's just life, ain't it? We all get those days. It's good always when you're up on the mountain and you're happy, but sometimes when you get down in the valley, and you get to praying more than you used to, <laughs> and you get closer to God because you need him more, and he shows up. I am so glad that tonight is Wednesday night. I am so glad that today is Wednesday. And God has got me here where I want to be, and I needed this. We'll talk about prayer in a little bit. All right, let's get back to the Apostle Paul and the book of Acts. We'll try to journey through this a little bit with you tonight. Paul now has, uh, not to go back too far, sometimes I go back too far that we don't progress far enough, but remember Paul has given his testimony of what God's done, how God saved him. We, we, we spent many weeks talking about that. And he's now coming to the conclusion of his testimony. We stopped last week in verse 16. Remember that there is a very rebellious crowd out there of Jewish people that hate Paul. And they hate him for this reason, that he was call to be the apostles to the Gentiles. Therefore, the Judas of that day hated him because they did not care about those people. And that's the reason he is in the predicament that he is in right now. And so as Paul is winding down his testimony of what God has done in his life, he says in verse 17, he says, and it come to pass that and, and that there means his salvation point in his life. Remember, he just gave him a salvation story. And then he makes a statement about it. You know, last week he said, I've got to go be baptized. 
and, and, and those things. But, and now he refers, that refers to his salvation experience. He said, And when I was come uh, again to Jerusalem, that even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. I got to think about that just a, a few minutes. I, I usually try to get her early enough to, to go over my scripture just to read it and refresh it in my mind, even though I studied it. And something popped up in my mind. Here's a man that was saved in a miraculous way. And now he has gone to the city of Jerusalem into the temple to pray. And while he is in the temple praying, something happens. Paul was put into, or Saul as he's known now, was put into a trance. See that? Here's this, there were six times in Paul's ministry where he had a trance and our vision. And, and, you know, in the Bible, I'll be preaching uh, in the next few weeks, probably two or three weeks, on, on, on I, I preach Sunday morning that God is assumed by the Bible, not proved, but then I'll be preaching that God is audible, that God speaks to us. And he speaks in many different ways. And he comes to Paul here in a vision. And there have been many people in the Bible that's had visions. I'm preaching to you about one on Sunday night for a year near about it. Daniel, that the most enthralling thing about Daniel is what? His visions. What God showed him. That's why Daniel is such a popular uh, thing when it comes to prophetic and, and prophesying the future because of the visions that God gave to him. John when he was on the Isle of Patmos, what did he say? That while I was on the Isle of Patmos, I became what? God began to speak to me, and I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And that's when God put him in that experience that God began to reveal to him the book of Revelation. While he was in that that spirit or trance or whatever you want to call it, that's, that's what happened to him. So this is nowhere near the many times that, that uh, men have, or have been spoken to by God in, in our scripture in Hebrews that I'll be preaching in the Sunday morning. It says that God speaks in various ways. This is one of them. And now Paul is, he experienced God on that Damascus road. He experienced God in all these churches that he had started over these three missionary journeys. And now as he's coming to the end of his way, and he goes back up into Jerusalem to do what? Pray. Folks, the thing I've learned, don't ever, ever, ever underestimate how important that it is to pray. I am telling you, without prayer, you think this world is hard. But without prayer and people praying for you and you praying, I don't know how people do it. I'll just be honest with you. Paul said, I went into the temple, not to preach, but to pray. And it was while I was in that spirit of prayer that God spoke to me in a trance. That God came personally much like he had on that Damascus road. And Paul says he began to have that trance literally means visions because he says in the following verse, and I saw him saying unto me, he said, God spoke to me in a vision, and this is what God said to me. Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Boy, that's a, that's a bad word there, ain't it? Paul, you need to leave. Now remember what Paul's desire was. To go to Jerusalem, that's right. And that was the one place that he wanted to go before he went to Rome. 
So he got there. Paul, uh, God was watching him all the time. And then as he enters into that, that, that wonderful city, the mobs begin to form. God has his eye on him. God sees what's about to happen. God already knows what's going to happen. And so God gives him a warning. And this is kind of what he's... You you remember one time in the story of Joshua that Joshua couldn't figure out why the Israelites were in the predicament they were in? Why they had lost the battle at Ai? Ai? why things were going in a, a not a good direction for them after they got in the promised land. And the Bible says that Joshua was in there just praying and praying and praying, and finally God said to him, what? There's sin in the camp. In the camp. You need to start praying. Stop praying. This is where God said, you need to quit praying and go do something about it. Now, for you and me, that would be foreign. But prayer, what do we say? You need to put feet in prayer. Prayer is just praying and not putting anything in it yourself. And that work. He said, Joshua, you need to get up and go do something. I can tell you, you got a problem, but you need to do something about it. You're, you're the man I appointed over that. And then he says to Saul, you need to stop praying too. And you need to get up. And you better get out of town. Because if you continue to stay here, these people will kill you. Now, we weren't there in the conversation. We only got what the Bible tells us about it. But this is why he said they're going to kill you. They're not going to listen to what you got to say anymore. Remember what Paul was doing here? He was giving what? His testimony, wasn't he? He was telling them how God had saved him and what God was doing in his life. And you would think that people would like to hear that kind of stuff but these people were in such a form that they did not want to hear about God, much like the world today. They were in such a way that they, God said, listen, you're wasting your time. And if you can, and, and his testimony was what? This is what your testimony's always got to be. He said, they don't want to listen to your testimony about who? Me. They don't hear about God. They don't want to hear about Jesus. This is Jesus speaking here. You see, it was in red, didn't you? Jesus said, I can tell you what. They're happy with their rituals. They're happy with their, their priest, and they're happy with their old ways of doing things that are, that, that are not any good, but they're happy with it. And they don't want to hear about Jesus. This is 2,000 years ago. And I look at us today, and I look at folks out there that if they could, would persecute the church just like they did Paul, and in many places in the world are persecuting the church just like that. You know why? Because they don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear about Jesus. Most of the world would rather hear one of these two things. They'd rather hear about Allah, or they'd rather hear about the Pope, because those are the largest religions that there are in the world. But let's don't make Jesus the priority. He says, if you keep on with this, you'll be killed. And then Paul says, and I said, Lord, I love this last two, three verses of Scripture right here. He said, Lord, remember God speaking to him. He's in a vision. Him and God, he's in a trance. God is, and Paul is real. It's just like, it's just like Tommy, you and I, he's talking with God. And he says, Lord, they know me. They know that I spent (laughs) many of the last few years in prison. Listen, I'm not going to say he was in some circles. He may have been famous, but in many of the circles of that day, he was infamous. To the people that were wanting to kill him, Paul was infamous. And he said, you know what? They know of my past. They know who I was. Everybody's got a past. Not everybody knows about our past, but God does. 
But Paul says these people that are trying to kill me, much of that has to do with my past. You see, when I was with them, I worked for them. I did their dirty work for them. I went after the church. But now that I've been saved, they feel like I am a traitor. But you know what? They know who I was. But for the last few years, I've been trying to tell them who I am now. You see, when you get saved, your testimony is not so much about who you were. It's all about who you are now. And so Paul says, they know that I was in prison. They know that I beat in every, every synagogue I went to where there were people worshiping Jesus. I took my soldiers in there and we beat them to a pulp. They know that. These same people that's trying to kill me. And they beat in every synagogue them that believed on you, on thee. He said, Lord, I kill people to believe in Jesus. For a big part of my life, I killed anybody that believed in Jesus. That's what I did. And they know it. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by. And I consented unto his death. One of the greatest men in the Bible that was a layman. He was not a preacher. He was a layman. He was a deacon. Many say he was the first deacon that was ever elected. And yet, Paul says, I was there when they killed him. And then he says, not only was I there and watching, but I rooted him on. I said, kill him. Stone him. Do whatever you want to do to him. I was in their corner at that time in my life, and, and I, I pushed them to do what they did. And then he says, I kept his ring of those that slew him. In other words, I said, boys, take your coats off so you can get loose when you start beating him or you need to pick up those big boulders and, and throw him down on him and kill him. I was there and I held their clothes while they stoned this man. And yet this man, you go throughout all the Bible, you go to Paul, you go to Peter, you go to John, you go to the 12 disciples, you can go back to David, the man after God's own heart. You can go back to Joshua, the great soldier of God. You can go back anywhere you want to in the Bible. But there was only one man that when he died, to this very day, there's only been one man that we know of that when he died, the Bible says that God stood up from the right hand of God and he welcomed this man into glory. He never did that for anybody else. That's amazing, isn't it? This guy wasn't an evangelist. He didn't have a great big old church. He wasn't a preacher. He was not a well-known. But he was a man that loved God and served God, and he's the one man that God stood up for. He's never, Jesus stood up for. He's never stood up, as far as I know, for anybody else. Never. But he did. And Paul said, Saul said, I was a part of that. And so he tells, I think that, that Saul is kind of a, a mood. He's in this place. Most of them want to kill him. He's kind of revisiting maybe what got him there. And God is trying to save him. Paul is, well, he don't need to tell God his story because nobody knows his story better than God does. Nobody, I believe, in all was ever handpicked more for the job than he was. So God says, and God don't say this, ain't Bible, this is Jimmy's paraphrasing. God says to him, Paul, I don't need to hear that. I was there when he killed Stephen. I saw what you did. I've seen what you've done. You don't have to tell me about it. I already took that away from you. I don't removed that from your past. If I hadn't removed that, I wouldn't have never called you. 
But I already dealt with that. So there's something more urgent than that right now, and that is this. You need to get out of there. So Paul saw God very plainly, speaks to him, and gives him a specific message. Leave here. Depart, for I will send thee far, hence unto the Gentiles. The thing that got him in the most trouble, God was fixing to send him back into again. Where? To Rome. I was studying. I've done a lot of studying these last few days. God just puts a lot of things in your mind when you open the Word and you're kind of in a, a funk sometimes, you're in a mood and you just need to hear from God and you need to learn something about God. And as I was studying Daniel, and I already knew this, but sometimes... God just needs to give you a refresher course sometimes to give you a reminder that there were four great empires. Now, I don't want to get too far because I'll, I'll tip off my Sunday night sermons. But in the visions that Belshazzar had, Belshazzar saw, saw four kingdoms that would rule the earth, did he? And I was studying this about the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the cruelest empire that has ever run the earth. They, they, we hear today a lot about Taliban and terrorists and, and those kinds of things in the world today, but I want to tell you this. 2,000 years ago, there was a Roman Empire that ruled the world that was just as bad to other people as the Taliban or anybody else is. They hung them, they cut their heads off, they stoned them, they beat them. That's who the Romans were. There's never been a kingdom like them. And this is the deal. God, Paul's an old man now. God's fixing to send him where? Kind of like Daniel. He's fixed to send him into the lion's den, which is wrong. The most evil, wicked people that have no respect for life, had no respect for life, and God is fixing to send him right in the middle of it. You would have thought God would have done this when he was a young man. Instead of waiting until he was about old, and like he said, I'm ready to depart and leave, but God said, no, no, no. I have one more place I want to send you, and this is going to be the worst place you've ever been. That's my last job for you. I want you to deal with the Romans. Ain't nobody ever dealt with them, he said. But I'm going to send you there. So get up from here, because there's a whole Gentile world. And lo and behold, listen, remember where we've been, how this starts. Who saves Paul from being killed here? The Romans, exactly. Had it not been for that regiment of Roman soldiers that heard all of this disruption in the city of government and all these people rioting and doing these things because they wanted to kill Paul and they knew that that word couldn't get back to Rome, that things had got out of hand, so they sent a thousand men down there to rescue Paul but to take him back to Rome. That's what's happening here. He said, depart, leave here. This is Jesus talking. For I will send thee far. And I'm going to send you to probably one of the most Gentile nations in the world. Wrong. Remember, I, I can't tell you that. Y'all get my secrets on Sunday night if I tell you that. I can't tell you that. I'll tell you that one Sunday night. And so, verse 22 says, So Paul has given his testimony now. They have listened to his testimony. Now we move into a different phase here. He's prayed. They're trying to kill him. The soldiers are trying to get him out. And they gave him audience unto this word. Then lifted up their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Wow. 
Here's a man praying to God. There's a mob out there that hates him so bad. And they just publicly say, this man needs to die. He, uh, this is a, have you ever heard anybody, I have, <laughs> use this term? Never thought about it being a biblical term. Where he says, this man is not fit to live. I've probably said about that about some people in my life that's been awful and bad and need to be put in an electric chair or wherever they need to go. I said, they're not fit to live because of what they... But they looked at this man of God and they said to him, what? Because he prays, because he goes to the temple, because he serves God, and he's not one of us. Well, he was one of them because he was a Roman. He needs to die. He needs to die. He's not fit. To live. That's exactly what the scripture says. He's not fit. And I never thought about that, Brother Gary, until I read this. But I've heard that term used before. Never knew it was in the Bible until I read it uh, in there in my studies. This. And then things begin to happen. He will be glad that he listened to God. That God was not through with him. And so they cried out, they cast off their clothes and they threw dust into the air. This is the scene. This is what's happening. Saul is in custody of the Roman soldiers. The people have been so hepped up. Remember, he's just got through giving his testimony of what has happened to him. God has said they're not going to listen to you. They said we want to kill him. That's what they wanted to do with him. And so they begin to cry out. That means they begin to scream. They begin to yell. They begin to do these things. They cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. Now you'll look at that and you'll say, well, yeah, that's there. What's that mean? They were so angry. I don't know, I've never had, uh, have I ever been angry? Sure I have. But have I ever had this kind of anger so bad at somebody that I would rip my clothes off? Rent, the Bible calls it rending your clothes. But, but that's what they did. And you know why they did this? I read this. That's the only reason I know this. <laughs> I did not know this till I read it. That they did this because this is what they did in preparation when they were going to stone somebody, that they, remember when he said, let us hold your garments? He said, I was there when he stoned Stephen. Remember when I just read you that? And he said, I held their garments while they did that. Well, so they could have freedom and, and pick up the rocks and all. And so what happens here after Paul gives his testimony, they're so angry that they begin to take their, their robes off because they're fixing to kill him like they did Stephen. That's what this means. And it says that they threw dust in the air. Now, this is not the only... You could go back to Job. You could go back to Sam. You could go back to some other places in the Bible, and you can find this term where it says that they threw dust into the air. When you read that term in the Bible, this is what it means. An intense motion of anger. When you reach down on it and you pick up dirt and you throw that dirt in the air, you know what that means? You're mad. You're angry. You're mad enough to kill somebody. This is not the only place in the Bible that that term is used. I did not know that until I went to this study. And so we have a very uh, intense situation fixing to happen here in Jerusalem. The soldiers see that. They know if they don't move quickly, this crowd will kill them. So the man in charge of this order, which his name was Lysias, he orders his soldiers to get on the move and to do something. The chief captain, that was Lysias. It says that he commanded him to be brought into the castle. And to be brought into the castle means the barracks. Take him off the street. Remember, he, 
He's asked, remember where we were. They've taken him into the barracks one time, remember? And they bring him back out and they let him address the people and give his testimony. Well, that didn't make the situation any better. As a matter of fact, when he gave his testimony, that made the situation worse. And so Lysias, the captain of the guard, says to his soldiers, get him back inside quick because if we don't, we'll not be able to hold off this mob out here. Let's take him back inside the temple there. Well, when you look at this and you read further, it says, and they bade that he should be examined by scourging. Now remember that I told you how brutal the Roman government was. How brutal the Roman soldiers were. That they would take whips and put sharp objects in them and they would just run where when they beat, like they did Jesus. See, these were the same ones beat Jesus here. And they take those whips and they beat you with things like that are sharp as what we would call razors today. They entwined them into those whips they had. So that when they beat you with those whips and they would rip those things out, it would open your body up and you would bleed to death. That's what they did. That was the Romans. Now they bring Paul inside. Their problem is... <laughs> They can't figure out what he's done to cause all this problem. Why are these people so angry at him? And so what they do is they begin to do what? Have an interrogation of Saul. Saul's already said his piece. If they were listening, they should have heard it. So now he doesn't say anything. And so they get their their soldiers with the whips, and they began beating Paul. This is the Romans where God has said, I am going to send them to you. Metal-tipped leather. That's what they had. Leather with metal tips in it. And they began beating him at that point. And then there's a question asked, and this turns everything around. It don't take a whole lot to turn things around very quickly for the good or the bad, right? Remember one thing. Now, where does this come from? This question. What makes anybody ask this question? They're beating him. He is laying there letting them beat them. And then somebody... Ask the question, a centurion. Now what it was, a centurion, this was a thousand man group of soldiers. In a thousand man group of soldiers, they would have ten leaders, one for each hundred men. When you see the term centurion, sin, sin is Latin for what? A hundred. So all of a sudden, somehow or another, and this leader probably of those men that are beating him, or maybe not, maybe he's just watching that, but there's a thought comes into it. Where does this thought come from? I don't know. It doesn't say. But all of a sudden it says what? He spoke out, and he asked the question. Is it lawful... So evidently, it's not his men doing, but it's somebody else. And he's talking to Lysias, the captain. He has, is it lawful? Now remember this. The Romans were very strict on law. Law was what they lived by. And so this soldier asked the question, is what we're doing legal according to Roman law? Is what we're doing, he says, in the scripture, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? So this guy says, what? Something don't feel right about it. You ever, had, you ever seen anything that 
I've been a part of something where it just didn't feel right. I have back in my younger days. You knew, you, you took part in it, but you know deep down what was going on wasn't right. And this soldier says, we might need to stop. Since we're so strict on the law, we've forgotten one of the most important parts of the law. And that is this. This man's had no trial. You cannot be a man nearly to death unless he is sentenced by a Roman judge for that. You cannot just take this matter in your own hand. And somehow or another, as I look at this, and I think, man, God showed up right on time here, didn't he? Paul almost got killed in the temple. Now he's moved into the Roman barracks and the Romans are about to beat him to death. Paul's having a bad day, ain't it? I mean, I think about sometimes I have a bad day. I ain't never had a day like this. For he's over one of the key, and then they move you over here, and then he's over here on the key. But somehow or another, in God's wisdom and God's way, like he always does, God intervened here. I've got to believe this is an intervention of God that comes, that hits this soldier and says, that's just not something right about what we're doing here. I've listened to this man's testimony. I've listened to what he had to say. And I've, never, I've not heard him say anything that makes me believe that this man deserves what he's getting here. He didn't know. But the one thing he did know, since he'd been there, this man had not been on trial. This man had not seen a judge. And Roman law says, you cannot do this to him unless he is found guilty by the Roman government. So he intervenes here. And he brings it to who? The centurion's attention. Now remember, the centurion's over, over a thousand men. So this soldier evidently is not of his group. But he addresses the leader of the men. And he says, Whoa. And you know, i got to think. I don't know this. I'm, I'm just kind of putting things out here. But I don't know this, but you... And I'm just asking the question, I don't know. Do you not think it might have been dangerous for him to question the authority of the centurion when he was just a soldier? Mr. Jim, you was in the military. you, you got to be careful about questioning authority, don't you? Now, but one thing about it, he was not afraid. He spoke up in defense of this man, Paul. So when he asked the question, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman? How do you know it was a Roman? How do you know Paul had dual citizenship? That Paul was a Jew, but he also had dual citizenship. He was a Roman. He says, when the centurion heard that, remember he's the one over the hundred, he goes and he tells the chief captain. The chief captain, he's the boss. He's the highest ranking officer there. And so the the leader of the hundred listens to a soldier and he goes, tells the leader of the whole uh, Roman army that is in Jerusalem and he questions, he tells the chief captain. And now stop with this. Take heed what thou doest. For this man is a Roman. I'm going to tell you something. I won't get in that because I ain't got time. I'm going to tell you what. When he made that statement right there, that sent shockwaves through the barracks right there. That turned everything around with that statement there. He is a Roman. That soldier, he was not an officer. He was not a leader. He was a soldier. And yet he was more aware 
of what was going on than the ones that were in charge were. He knew something wasn't right. He knew that they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And he had enough about him to just ask the question, are we doing what's right? You know, some people, instead of asking the question, is this right, they'll just go along. Not to... It would have been easy to go along there and just step back and be beat to death, wouldn't it? Not stick out like a sore thumb, not be the only one just descending in the whole military that's there, but this one man. See, what the world will forget and what I'll forget is all this is going on in life. This is an unknown man that will never know his name probably that stood when there were 999 other soldiers and none of them were willing to step up. But here was one man out of the thousand that stood up in Paul's defense. Wow. We'll never know who he was, probably. And he would buy, no, most people never think about it. Nobody, most people will never know he's even in the Bible. But one man can, listen, you always hear this question. Can one man make a difference? Can one woman make a difference? Can one church Make a difference? Sure we can. This man, I believe, through the leadership of God, remember the Holy Spirit had already been in the temple with Paul. Somehow or another, I don't say it, but I believe this had to move over there. Something changed there. Something made this man. Maybe he heard a rumor. I don't know. Maybe, and I, I don't know enough to realize. Maybe somewhere along the way, Paul had told me. I don't know. Probably, I don't know all the answers to that. But I do know one thing. <laughs> one of the things in the Bible, and one of the things I like, and I hear preachers talk, and I've, I've, I've said it myself many times, talking about a man like Joseph, who Joseph even said this, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. I see that in this story here. This is going to be a life change. This is going to be a, a nation changing thing here. This is such a simple verse of scripture. But there's so much said in here that changed the whole direction of the world of that day for the Jews and the Gentiles. And we'll overlook that most of the time. We'll never think about it. that man, that day, how close Paul was to dying. And yet God was not, what did we say, Connie? A man of God in the will of God will what? He'll never die until his work for God is done. You know the reason Paul didn't die there? His work for God wasn't done. God had before him the greatest challenge that he would probably face. His greatest and hardest difficult job was yet to come. So God stepped up through a soldier. God stepped up through a military man and helped save Paul's life. We'll stop there. Thank you all so much, uh, Dwight, for being with us tonight. We're going to uh, take the next 10, 15, 20 minutes or so and, and, and you know, I've talked to a lot. I've got a song that I want to play for you tonight, but I've got to start to, to, to play it. This would be a good time to play it. It's about prayer, but... I might save that for next week tonight. Uh, it's about, the name of that song is Somebody Prayed For Me. Any of y'all ever heard that song before? Somebody Prayed For Me. Whew. That's good. I, that, I said, I thought to do that, and I said, this is what I'll do right before we pray. Because we'll play that song about prayer. But I, I might do that next week tonight. Anyway, um, if you have your prayer list with you tonight, um,